the recession, going back to what, if it, unless, I hope it doesn't happen, but obviously we have forecast it because we think it is uh, sadly the, the most likely outcome, of course, is, is overwhelmingly caused by the actions of Russia and, and the impact on, on energy prices. Inflation in our country is just far too high. Uh, we're not close to the Federal Reserve's uh, target for inflation, and so I'm quite focused and the Fed is quite focused on making sure we do the steps necessary to bring inflation back down to its target. We're in this for as long as it takes to get inflation down. So far, we've expeditiously raised the policy rate to the peak of the previous cycle, and the policy rate will need to rise further. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, Early Edition, with Francine Lacqua. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lackley here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Showtime, the ECB is on the brink of a jumbo 75 basis point hike, even as recession risks rise. EU leaders ready emergency energy measures. As long as it takes, El Brainard joins a chorus of Fed speakers vowing to do whatever is needed to beat inflation. Plus, historic drop. Sterling hits a Thatcher-era low on Liz Truss's first day in office. She lays out her plan to tackle soaring gas and power prices today. Now, first thing is first, let's check on the markets. Of course, uh, Sterling and a lot of the currency moves are really capturing the imagination of certain traders as we go into some of this global competitiveness. And it's extremely difficult uh, to fight the Fed. John Authors with a fantastic piece uh, saying that he doesn't really see what could stop the dollar's ascent. This is a picture for European stocks, sir. We're off the day's highs. Of course, this is as investors are preparing for this potentially unprecedented rise in interest rates at the ECB. Madame Lagarde will have to explain, of course, her reasoning if she front loads and does 75 basis points. Extremely interesting also to see her forecasts for the future in terms of inflation expectations. U.S. 10-year yield, 32636. Euro doll, 9986. This will probably have to be addressed, although I know central bankers hate speaking about currencies in some shape or form. She'll have to address this because the weaker the euro, sure, it helps with exports, uh, but it's also much inflationary. And then finally, crude oil, 88.36. Now let's look at the European map. Again, it's a big day here in the U.K. We have Liz Truss and you Prime Minister in charge for her second full day. Uh, she'll give that package on energy with hopefully details also on how she funds it. And then we heard from the Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng. We know he's meeting uh, with the JP Morgan chief executive this morning. Yesterday he made 14 leaders from the finance industry and said he will deregulate and spur the city of London. The DAX unchanged, the CAC 40 unchanged, and the FTSE may be into the down one tenth of eight percent. So the ECB holding its first monetary policy meeting since July when officials raised the key rate for the first time since 2011. The central bank is on the brink of a jumbo 75 basis point hike to wrestle back control over record inflation, even if the risk of a eurozone recession rises. Now, for more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Europe correspondent, Maria Tadeo. Maria, the big question, 75 or 50? 75 or 50, Francine, that's the only question because when it comes to the uh, direction here, the only way is up for the European Central Bank. Single mandate central bank, inflation now clearly way above target. They have to hike. Now, is it going to be 75? Will it be 50? When you look at the 75 basis points camp, what they say is right now there's a window. And in that window, you have to be decisive and you have to take swift action. Ultimately, this is about the credibility of the institution going forward. You have to show that you can get a hold of inflation. The 50 basis points uh, camp, this may be on the minority, but they do bring up a fair argument, which is ultimately this is an economy that is facing the risk of a recession, but also now a full-blown energy crisis. The solutions for that energy crisis will be debated tomorrow. But for the time being, you've seen the market action. These are prices up for Europeans. They're coming at a very, very heavy cost. So ultimately, the response, which way this is going to fall, we'll find out in about a few hours hours time uh, here in Frankfurt, of course, then followed by that press conference by Christine Lagarde. Yeah, I mean, there are three things also that Van Rom said we should be watching at the margin, of course, euro. When you look at that tool, that mechanism to deal with rising yields, I know Maria and I will also be following the Italian elections uh, very, very closely and then inflation forecast. Maria, thank you so much. As always, Maria Tadeo there in front of the ECB in Frankfurt. Now, of course, we'll also have comprehensive coverage of the ECB rate decision and Christine Lagarde's news conference today from 1.15 p.m. UK time, so stay tuned for that. So joining us now for the next 20 minutes to talk about ECB, to talk about 
about the UK, really to talk about everything. Uh, Simon French at Chivicon was at Panier Gordon. Simon, I mean, first of all, good morning. Good morning. I mean, are you just relieved that you're not working at the ECB? Because it's a bit of a nightmare. Do you front load or not in this kind of environment? I don't think they know, to be honest. And I think what we get today will be the updated staff projections yeah. and some estimate, probably not stated explicitly, but I would be staggered if it doesn't get mentioned in questions, what the terminal rate is for ECB uh, deposit rates. Because actually what we heard from Isabel Schnabel, Philip Lane, ahead of blackout, was the idea that that question of front loading really d the scale of that whether it's 50 whether it's 75 for people trying to trade the decision today really depends where the staff projections and indeed the governing council see that terminal rate going and therefore where the front loading looks in the context yeah. of a 200 spread that, or potentially higher that's so that's so difficult because if you look at the second round effects if you look at third round i mean we could see so many companies in germany and in the countries most affected by energy prices just go under yes and, and yeah, and one of the things that actually the ECB won't have at their disposal, which we get next week, is labour cost data for right. Q2. Yeah. And, and that's going to be one of the big inputs for those second round effects, which uh, the ECB won't have at their disposal. They'll go with the anecdotal, the other survey-based data that those are starting to build. But we've also heard of market shift in the commentary towards inflation expectations with the, exp with the anticipation yeah. that those are a leading indicator of what yeah. wage settlements will be across the Eurozone and therefore that persistence of inflation. I, I hate being beating up on economists especially as Go I have on. one of my Go favorite on. right here on set <laughs> with me but their 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 staff projections have been so wrong mm -hmm. in you know they haven't been able to really see the crystallization of this much higher inflation why do we believe them now so I'm going to defend economic forecasters Please. not just in the eurozone <laughs> not just the ECB but across the world what they have to do is they have to take conditional assumptions yep. on the pathway for energy market and the justification from the ECB from the Fed from the BOE is well there are people with skin in the game people watching this program who trade energy yes. why should we what, what is better than taking the price of people who whose livelihoods are dictated by trying to price that market correctly what has happened in successive forecasts is those curves have fundamentally shifted from what they were in the preceding forecast that is why we've had persistent one-sided errors that is not excusing it away it's explaining it away because there tends to be, not on this show, I hasten to add, but often there's a lot of shrill commentary yes. at, you know, beating up forecasters. But those conditional assumptions, if someone can come up with a better assumption yeah. than using the, the market yeah. forward curve, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, no, you're 100% fair. And at the same time, if you look at what we're living through, is a central bank trying to, to you know, deal with these supply shocks. And frankly, it's just not really up to them. It depends on fiscal and the fiscal support they want to give. Absolutely, which is why the market still sees that terminal rate may change today, but around 2%. And you may say, well, hang on, but inflation's running at 9%, inflation expectations are moving up, the expectation those will start to feed through into second round wage settlements. Why are we not talking about terminal rates, 3 4 5%? And it's for just that reason that a lot of the heavy lifting on medium term, longer term deflation is coming through from the removal of consumer spending power expected to pass through into labour markets, the negotiating power, and therefore bring down that inflationary picture over the medium term, agnostic of what the central bank, not just in Europe, but in the UK, in many energy importing countries around the world, the heavy lifting is done by wholesale energy markets, right. not by policy yeah. rates. So, so if you look at your weakness, mm. is it really only dollar strength? And if you look at these global imbalances, is there anything that will stop the dollar's rise? If we'd had this conversation a month or so ago, I'd have said it's, it's largely you know, dollar strength. But you're starting to see now when you track the relative spreads between two-year yields in Europe, in the UK, with the US, uh, you know, around the world, there's quite a tight relationship. But when you start to see effectively rate hikes not underscoring your currency, you're starting to see a bit of a breakdown in that relationship, suggesting it's not just a Fed story here. All right, Simon, thank you so much. Simon French, there, Chief Economist at Panier Gordon, stays with us. We'll talk about the UK shortly. And actually, Simon French was on the podcast, and he predicted everything that happened this week. So we'll talk a lot more with Simon French about the UK in about 15 minutes from now. Coming up, though, we speak to an Italian MP, Deborah Bergamini, about the upcoming Italian election. She could also be one of uh, the kingmakers, the rainmakers in the EU coalition. So don't miss that interview. It's coming up next. And this is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, when Italians vote on the 25th of September, Giorgia Meloni's decade-old right-wing party, Brothers of Italy, is expected to emerge as the largest party in parliament. Meloni is in turn projected to be the nation's first female prime minister propelled into office by disenchanted voters who, are, who aren't shy of betting on the tough-talking firebrand who remains dogged by controversy. Well, joining us now is Debra Bergamini. Uh, she is Forza Italia MP, a former Berlusconi spokesperson, and of course she's also led some of the task forces under uh, Mario Draghi. Debra, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, talk to us about coalition mm -hmm. building. So what does Mr. Berlusconi want in all of this? Does he want the presidency of the Senate? No, he has excluded this. He's not interested in any sort of political or institutional role for his future. He's uh, very happy to get back to the Senate, where he was sent away in 2013 in an incredible political event. So he's back to the Italian Senate, and we're all glad about this, but he's not expecting anything for himself. Do you think Giorgia Meloni to definitely become prime minister if Brothers of Italy end up being the biggest party in the election? Well, that is a role that the president of the republic uh, will, uh, will have. So it, it will be him who will decide. Of course, we expect the coalition of center-right, and this is true according to all the polls, to win by a landslide almost. So we are very positive in imagining that uh, one of the leaders will be uh, you know chosen for the role and uh, within our coalition the agreement is that the party who will get more votes uh, will have the right to indicate the prime minister so we will respect that that agreement I mean, of course, if you look at the polls right now, it would be a three-way coalition, Forza Italia, Brothers of Italy, and uh, Salvini's party. Do you think that you would be you know, willing to ditch Salvini to have a more fiscally responsible, maybe more market-pleasing government? But we will be responsible. We need to be responsible. We owe it to our six, over 60 million Italian citizens that need responses that are responsible so we will respect all the all the views that we have to do and we will be respectful of the pn double air plan with respect to to europe we know that there's no choice other than this i want to underline that the center right coalition is a coalition that dates back to over 20 years ago and we are ruling today 14 italian regions out of 20 and many important cities so you know we have a long experience of being together and working together for the sake of Italian citizens. Then Forza Italia is the very center of this coalition, the most moderate and liberal and pro-European force, and we will yeah. play our role into this. Uh, of course, when you really become or come into government, it's also about attracting foreign investment. So how protectionist do you think this government will be? Well, I don't expect the, the future uh, government to be protectionist. We live on export. You know how much has been estimated the value of the Italy brand? That's $2,000 billion. So we are an export country. We know that you know protectionism wouldn't help this sort of physiognomy that we have in our economy. So I don't think there's any risk of protectionism. Uh, rather, we will try to cut taxes because you know Italy is a country where the relationship between the state and payers, taxpayers, has never been, you know, very yeah. positive. So what we think we, we will do, and we have done it in the past already when we were at the government, is to reduce the tax pressure in order to give right. more money to families and enterprises. Uh, Mr. Salvini basically says that Russia's sanctions are not working. Do you agree with that? Well, this is not what he's saying, but he is... Uh, sharing a reflection on the fact that these sanctions are imposing sacrifices on our citizens. And we, we knew that right at the beginning. We knew that there would be some sacrifices to do in order to state our belonging to democracy and freedom. So we will continue to support sanctions. Lega and Forza Italia have done that always 
during the Draghi government. We know that this will mean some sacrifices, but we also know that this is the only way in order to defend our richness, right. our countries, and our citizens. So, Deborah, just so I understand 100% of the markets understand, Forza Italia's position right now is pro sanctions. If there's yes. a coalition agreement with the three parties, how do you reconcile the differences that you have with Salvini? But these differences are along the electoral campaign. Each party has the right to put on the table their reflections, their ideas. But then facts are different. And the, the party of Salvini along the Draghi government, always when we had to decide whether to to go ahead with sanctions or not, they always decided yes in the parliament. So they have been consistent with the general position of the center-right coalition. And they will be consistent, I expect, also in the future. Deborah Bergamini, thank you so much for joining us today. Forza Italia, and being former Berlusconi Spurks person, of course, also in charge of uh, one of these studies and, of course, fiscal briefs that Mario Draghi put in place. So we'll have plenty more from uh, Simon French a little bit later. I'll ask him whether the ECB should worry a lot more or the markets should worry a lot more about the Italian election, certainly, than they are now. Coming up, the UK has a new government. It's planning to announce a new energy plan to tackle sky high bills for people and companies. That's coming up next. And this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition of Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, we're getting some breaking news out of Tesla. Um, this time, I mean, it's always Elon Musk, but this time it's not for Twitter. Tesla delivers uh, just under 80,000 Chinese-made cars, so made in China, in their new factory over there for the month of August. That means it's up from 170 two percent month on month but that is probably because the lockdowns mean that it was just closed in the past now let's get straight to the Bloomberg first for news here's Laura Wright hi Laura hi Francine US national security advisor Jake Sullivan is warning that a Chinese invasion of Taiwan remains a distinct threat he's insisting the White House's position over the island status has not changed despite China's claims to the contrary he spoke to Bloomberg for the David Rubenstein show peer-to-peer -peer conversations I think it remains a distinct threat uh, that there could be a military contingency around Taiwan. And uh, the People's Republic of China has actually stated as official policy that it is not taking the invasion of Taiwan off the table. That in the U.S., President Joe Biden is holding back on a decision to scrap Trump-era tariffs on Chinese imports. We're told that's as the administration studies ways to help businesses seeking relief. Any decision before the U.S. midterm elections in November poses domestic and international risks for Biden and his fellow Democrats. The Federal Reserve's battle to bring inflation under control will likely cause more harm to the U.S. and world economy than anticipated. That's according to a pair of papers set for presentation at a Brookings Institution conference this week. One says the Fed will have to push unemployment higher to hit its inflation target. The other warns of the dangers of developing nations from rising U.S. interest rates and a strong dollar. China has extended the lockdown of its megacity Chengdu, home to 21 million people. It's the largest city to shut since Shanghai earlier this year. The decision to prolong the week-long lockdown shows Beijing remains committed to COVID-0, even as it becomes more costly for the economy. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg Francine. Laura, thanks so much. We're getting some break news out of Japan. The foreign exchange chief, Mr. Kanda, speaking in Tokyo after a meeting on the financial stability. Now, he says, first of all, watch the FX market with a high sense of urgency. Uh, fundamentals alone, he says, cannot justify the recent yen move, and he will not rule out any response options if the move continues. We're lucky. We have Simon French. He said, if we don't talk yen, I'm walking out. So there it is. We have a lot of breaking news uh, from Japan. I mean, a bit of a nightmare, actually, for Japan, because they started talking tough, and mm. that didn't do the trick yesterday. Yeah, and I completely disagree with Mr. Kanda. Actually, if you plot the spread now emerging between Treasuries and JGBs, actually, the yen has re reacted almost perfectly in fit mm -hmm. with when you compare it across the other G10 currencies. So I would say it's not an outsized move based on 
on the sort of fundamental divergence of monetary policy. Now, is it uncomfortable? A depreciation of nearly 20%, uh, you know, against the US dollar? Deeply uncomfortable. Is he trying to talk the market back? Yes. Will but it I, work? But, but the phrase, it's decoupled from the fundamentals, I don't think stands up to much analytical scrutiny. I'd love to see it's working. Yeah, so, so, but does it just go lower? I mean, given everything? Well, the problem, of course, is how much of it is already in the price because, of course, we talked about, you know, at the top of the show about terminal rates. Yeah. What does the terminal Fed rate look like and to what degree does that move? It's actually, I think most people would anticipate that the Japanese policy rate is not going to shift much from the zero lower bound. The Fed rate probably plateauing about yeah. four, but, of course, if that spread widens on expectations, not on policy action, that's what might move the yen further. All right, Simon, thanks so much. Simon French, Chief Economist at Pendle Gordon stays with us. We kept the best for last. We're speaking UK. This is Simon's also expertise. The Prime Minister Trust set to announce her energy plans. We'll discuss that next. This is Bloomberg. Showtime. The ECB is on the brink of a jumbo 75 basis point hike, even as recession risks rise. EU leaders ready emergency energy measures. As long as it takes, El Brainard joins a chorus of Fed speakers vowing to do whatever is needed to beat inflation. Plus, historic drop. Sterling hits a Thatcher era low. On Liz Truss's first day in office, she lays out her plan to tackle soaring gas and power prices today. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the UK's new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, will set out her plan to tackle soaring energy bills today, hopefully with a bit more meat on the bone on how she'll fund it. One thing we don't expect to see in those plans is a windfall tax on energy companies, as Truss has repeatedly come out against the idea, believing it may discourage investment in the UK. I am against a windfall tax. I believe it is the wrong thing. To be, to be putting companies off investing in the United Kingdom just when we need to be growing the economy. What we need to do is increase our energy supplies long term. And that is why we will open up more supply in the North Sea, which the Honourable Gentleman has opposed. That is why we will build more nuclear power stations, which the Labour Party didn't do when they were in office. And that is why we will get on with delivering the supply as well as helping people through the winter. Well, let's bring in Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden, who was at Westminster yesterday, Downing Street the day before. So, Lizzie, uh, much of the bill has been leaked. What are we looking out for today? First of all, Francine, the price tax. So Bloomberg's seen documents uh, suggesting that this is going to cost £200 billion, but lots of different figures floating around. Even with that spending, uh, the documents suggest that people's energy bills will still be almost triple what they were last year, so not all the pain removed. Secondly, how targeted will these measures be? How much waste will there be fiscally? And thirdly, how is it all going to be paid for? You heard Liz Trust there seemingly ruling out a windfall tax, but later in the day... Uh, it seems that perhaps she might uh, continue the current windfall tax but not increase the rate or extend it to include power uh, generators. The, uh, given uh, what she said about the windfall tax, though, there's surely going to be a lot more borrowing. And we heard from the BOE Governor Andrew Bailey in front of the Treasury Select Committee yesterday uh, saying that perhaps they're going to have to put the brakes on quantitative ease, uh, tightening yeah. uh, uh, given the impact this would have. So, Lizzie, what are we seeing in terms of what it means for BOE? I don't know what, you know, if it helps or hinders inflation. Um, I mean, two actually both being the same thing. If you're hindered, it helps with inflation, certainly from a Bank of England point of view. And whether its independence is no longer under threat. I think the difference is, uh, the distinction that needs to be made, and as Hugh Pill, the Chief Economist of the Bank of England, made at the Treasury Select Committee yesterday, between the short and the long-term impact. So Bloomberg Economics reckons that this package means inflation will have already peaked, uh, and that means that we won't have 75 basis points at the next BOE meeting this month, uh, and also a recession can be avoided. On that point, Andrew Bailey disagreed. He said uh, that we are still going to have a recession. I'm interested what Simon French thinks about 
about that. Uh, but the difference is the long term. And uh, our economists reckon that this package means the economy will overheat and so rates will stay higher for longer. You mentioned about BOE independence. There's been a huge change of tune from this government uh, on that. Kwasi Kwarteng seems to be on the charm offensive with the city. Yesterday he said that the BOE's independence is sacrosanct and he's even going to have weekly meetings with the governor, twice weekly to begin with. What do we know about the City of London? There seems to be this unleashing of regulation. When do we find out more? Yeah, the Big Bang too. Again, this seems to be part of Kwasi Kwarteng's charm offensive. And finally, they seem to be uh, taking notice of the markets. We had Philip Hammond, the former Chancellor, on this programme with us, uh, talking about how this government needs to uh, pay attention. Because yesterday, of course, we had a terrible day for the pound, the worst since Margaret Thatcher. Although Andrew Bailey also said, that that could be a lot to do with dollar strength. Lizzie, thanks so much. Lizzie Burden there with the very latest. We had some fun facts. I mean, last time uh, the pound was so low in 1985, like Back to the Future was number one on our, on our movies list. Let's get back to Simon French. He's chief economist at Panier Gordon. Simon, you came on the podcast two weeks ago. You said, you know, be careful because the list trust we're seeing in the campaign is going to be different. Is she that, that difference in terms of windfall tax? I know there's a bit of, I guess, softening uh, against the Bank of England. What else? Well, she said no handouts. Uh, that was very clear on the campaign trails. No handouts, which had to be interpreted as no transfers to support households with their energy costs. Well, what we're going to hear today is a tens, potentially hundreds of billions of pounds intervention, which won't go direct to households. It'll go via the energy companies in terms of, you know, covering the spread between the wholesale prices they've got to buy electricity and the prices they have to charge. But I think we are seeing a difference between the campaign messaging yes. and the realities of governance. And, and Lizzie also mentioned the Bank of England independence, some questions about money supply targeting, doing a mandate review. Certainly her new chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, is rowing back from those comments, certainly if yesterday could be taken as an example of what they're going to say going forward. So deal with the energy crisis, mm. unregulate the city of London to make that boom that we've seen in the past. Does it make sense? We had this pretty scathing note from Deutsche Bank three days ago saying, look, we could also see an IMF intervention and actually to deal with the balance of payments. Sterling has to, you know, I think collapse by another 30 percent. Mm. Sterling weakening and indeed nominal yields going higher on gilts is a logical way to clear the market based on the fact there's probably going to need to be additional issuance yeah. to deal with an energy price intervention on this scale. So it may not sit on the balance sheet of the, the government. There are some suggestions it may sit on retail banking balance sheets. We'll, we'll get some of those details later today. But either way, higher issuance, got to clear the market, bring in foreign investors by reducing the, the value of your exchange rate. The question is, and it goes back, actually, there's a theme running through this show. It's about the terms of trade, the second order effects that could happen from you know, a weak pound when we're very import intensive in terms of the energy mix and the food mix and what that does to the cost of living. It, it feels a little bit like an emerging market. Am I being too harsh? Uh, I don't like that. Her personal view is I don't like that. I think that's a bit too uh, headline chasing from some of the banks that put that out. There is no doubt that sterling has not just been hit by the strength of the dollar, but has also seen some concerns over the institutional structure, the sustainability of its dual deficits. But an emerging market um, tends to be tends to trade on a broader set of factors than just those twin deficits, broader institutional frameworks. And there we've seen a bit more of a firming and perhaps a break from the Johnson era. The trust era looks to be a little bit more, if you like, consistent with some of those key architects that make it a developing market rather than an emerging market. If you look at the focus on the City of London, mm. is this a good or a bad thing for, for the overall economy? This is something that we did not hear from Boris Johnson's government and you could argue well it means that they'll focus less on maybe you know the counties that need it the most elsewhere. So I think it's a good thing. I think if you're, I didn't, certainly didn't expect uh, Liz Truss on the campaign trail to talk about Solvency 2 and Mifid 2, <laughs> but she did. And it sounds like they're going to review and continue to review through bills currently going through Parliament and potentially consultations coming out over the winter. Whether freed from the 
requirement to align yourselves with the EU27, whether there are areas which, you know, there's always a delicate balancing act to strike between global and indeed European uh, equivalence uh, alignment that, that is, you know, reduces friction on financial services trade versus some stuff which I think very reasonably the FCA, the Treasury are looking at and the Bank of England will be looking at and saying actually this doesn't suit the outsized nature of the UK financial sector which is 8-9% of GDP and therefore to your to question does it suit the UK's interest to perhaps pursue a bit of regulatory arbitrage given the scale of it, the financial services sector yes I think it does. Um, so I'm going back to forecast so when do you see peak pain for the UK economy and I wonder whether we're maybe being too pessimistic I, I mean not we but hmm. some banks I mean also putting like inflation at 20 30 percent where do you see peak inflation next year and peak interest rates? Well peak inflation I think in this cycle will come this year uh, Lizzie asked what, you know, what I thought about both the inflation and the growth outlook. Um, I think that the five-quarter recession the Bank of England had in their April, uh, sorry, their August oh, NPR yeah. is no longer fit for purpose given the scale yeah. of the fiscal intervention. I still see a shallow recession in Q4 and Q1, mm -hmm. but then recovering going Q2 yeah. and through 2023. But in terms of inflation, I expect it to peak in October between 10 and 11 percent, you know, way down on the 18 percent, 22 percent, although in defence to Citigroup and Goldman Sachs, not a phrase you'd expect me to say, but in defence of them, those uh, forecasts were conditional on no fiscal yes. intervention. I just, at the time when clients asked me about this, I said, do we really think there's going to be no fiscal intervention? I spoke to you on the yeah. podcast, I said, there's an intervention coming. The question, will, one we find out today, is what that shape and the scale will look like. But certainly, inflation on that scale looks very, very unlikely with a unit cost cap on gas. And so interest rates from the Bank of England, what, stabilising at around 25 3%? No, I think higher than that. I think there is, uh, we're hearing... How much higher? Well, I think but in the sort of 35 to 4% range. Um, why does it need to go that high? because in you know what what the package gives on one hand in terms of reducing headline inflation, uh, it takes away on the other hand in terms of, you know, it takes away the, the really bad macroeconomic outcome that was penciled in for 2023. And therefore, Hugh Pill, at, uh, the chief economist of the Bank of England, talking to lawmakers yesterday, was very much talking about, actually, I'm not convinced the path has materially shifted from the curve, and the market curve does see us heading to 4% bank rate by about the middle of next year. And that is quite a considerable uplift from where we sit. So that's very much a coordinated move from the ECB, the Fed, and the Bank of England. Simon, just brilliant analysis as always. Simon French, their Premier Gordon's chief economist. Coming up, Apple reveals it will not be raising prices in the US as it holds its biggest product launch event of the year. More on that next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. This is a picture for stocks. They're rebounding somewhat, but off the day's highs. Uh, if you look at what, of course, investors are thinking or worrying about, they face a harsh reality of sharp rate rises. The ECB, for example, takes center stage later today. Bloomberg Economics predicting a 75 basis point increase to front load tightening, even as the region grapples with an energy crisis. Now, at its biggest product launch of the year, Apple unveiled a new lineup of devices with one major surprise. It did not raise its U.S. prices during one of the worst years for inflation in decades. Bloomberg's Emily Chang has more of the details. Coming to you from Apple headquarters in Cupertino, Apple unveiling a slew of new products, including new iPhones, watches, and AirPods. Perhaps the biggest surprise isn't the new technology, but how much it costs. Despite record inflation, Apple isn't raising the prices on its new phone. So you can buy a new iPhone 14, for the same price you could buy an iPhone 13 last year. Of course, there are technological upgrades, especially when it comes to the Pro, thinner, faster, longer battery life, better camera technology, also satellite capabilities for all the new iPhone 14s, meaning you can send an emergency SOS from wherever you are in the world, even if you don't have service. They also unveiled a new Apple Watch Ultra, this a smartwatch geared toward outdoor enthusiasts. They call it uh, your own personal dive computer, if you will, also undercutting 
Garmin, the nearest competitor on price by a few hundred dollars if you're looking at the higher end. And when it comes to AirPods, we got the first upgrade there in two years. Of course, the big question is, will consumers buy any of these new products when they're already under pressure, facing higher prices, everything when it comes to gas and groceries? So all eyes will be on just how big this new Apple upgrade cycle will be. Emily Chang, Bloomberg, Cupertino. Now let's bring in Alex Webb from Bloomberg. Quick take for more analysis. Alex, don't do what Francine does. I got, I mean, they didn't raise prices. And like two months ago, I got an Apple 13. Ah, I should have lived, I should have called you before making that decision. Yeah, but ultimately, the kind of maybe the biggest surprise is <laughs> there weren't that many surprises. It's not a significant upgrade. So actually, yeah, you might be getting a little bit more for your money this time around. And the prices are the same as they were for this. But you're probably it's not vastly different from this iPhone 14. There were a lot of comments that actually it was the smallest upgrade in that people could remember. Yeah, but g given that inflation, you know, we're expecting it to rise by so much and they haven't raised prices, does it show us that they're worried about market share, that they're worried about spending? Well, the thing was quite interesting heading into this is there have been reporting from our colleagues in Taiwan about the number of iPhones they were expecting to manufacture, the number they've ordered from their suppliers. And actually, the number is flat compared to last year. Now, usually you would expect with an upgrade cycle that you'd be selling more iPhones. Now, the fact that it's flat does speak to the su suggestion, at least, that, you know, there isn't going to be as much consumer spending. We know this. We know this from other places. So keeping the, market, the, the price flat, the market took, sorry, the street took pretty yeah. positively because they think that maybe actually that will drive some more buying than had been expected. So then they focus on the watch, on this like, what's it called, the ultra watch, which frankly I will never ever use because I'm not a, an iron woman or not in that kind of like high competitive space that they're going after. Yeah, so it's interesting because Apple has about 35, 36% market share in smartwatches in total. Over, yep. But in the space of more than $500, Garmin really dominates. You know, the people who are marathon runners, rock climbers, divers, they far prefer Garmin's. And so Apple is really coming after Garmin in that space. The thing that's quite, and it is coming at a lower price point than Garmin. Interestingly, the battery life is not as good as what, what Garmin is able to do. So, you know, it, the hobbyists may be there is still a reason why they yeah. might go towards Garmin, but Apple is coming after but them. Alex, is that a gimmick or they can really, really make a lot of money? I don't know how many Garmin are sold, for example, a year. Yeah. I mean, look, Garmin is a far, far, far smaller company than Apple, which kind of probably speaks to the scale of it. The, you know, don't forget, the, the iPhone still accounts for 50% of Apple's revenue. And Apple Watch, it doesn't even break out individually. It just has it in sort of other devices, So that, prob that which includes things like HomePod, the uh, AirPods, all these things, it lumps them all in together, which kind of speaks to maybe how big a market it is. You know, not nothing to sniff about, but not anything near the iPod, uh, iPhone. Sorry. iPhone. Alex, thanks so much. Alex Webb there from Bloomberg. Quick take on Apple. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news. Here's Laura Wright. Hi, Laura. Hi, Francine. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan is warning that a Chinese invasion of Taiwan remains a distinct threat. He's insisting the White House's position over the island's status has not changed. Despite Chinese claims to the contrary, he spoke to Bloomberg for the David Rubenstein Show peer-to-peer -peer conversations. I think it remains a distinct threat uh, that there could be a military contingency around Taiwan. And uh, the People's Republic of China has actually stated as official policy that it is not taking the invasion of Taiwan off the table. That in the UK, new Prime Minister Liz Truss will today set out her plan to tackle soaring energy bills. It will be her first significant act as leader. Truss has been trying to evoke memories of her Tory predecessor, Margaret Thatcher. The UK hit another unwelcome comparison to the Thatcher era yesterday, with the pound falling to the lowest level against the dollar since 1985. In the US, President Joe Biden is holding back on a decision to scrap Trump-era tariffs on Chinese imports. We're told that as the administration studies ways to help businesses seeking relief, any decision before the US midterm elections in November poses domestic and international risks for Biden and his fellow Democrats. The Federal Reserve's battle to bring inflation under control will likely cause more harm to the U.S. and world economy than anticipated. That's according to a pair of papers set for presentation at a Brookings Institution conference this week. One says the Fed will have to push unemployment higher to hit its inflation target. The other warns of the dangers of developing nations from rising U.S. rates and a strong dollar. 
Australia has passed its first major climate legislation in more than a decade. The climate change bill legislates a 43% cut to carbon dioxide emissions from 2005 levels by 2030. Enshrining the target into laws brings Australia in line with nations like Canada, South Korea and Japan, but it still lags behind key allies including the US and the UK. China extended the lockdown of its megacity Chengdu, home to 21 million people. It's the largest city to shut since Shanghai earlier this year. The decision to prolong the week-long lockdown shows Beijing remains committed to COVID-0, even as it becomes more costly for the economy. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg Francine. Laura, thanks so much. Laura Wright. Now, coming up, cashing in with the Kardashians. Well, reality TV star and billionaire entrepreneur Kim Kardashian is starting her own private equity firm, so we'll have plenty more of that next. This is Bloomberg. In our country is just far too high. Uh, we're not close to the Federal Reserve's uh, target for inflation. And so I'm quite focused, and the Fed is quite focused, on making sure we do the steps necessary to bring inflation back down to its target. So I'm, I am committed to doing that. I know my colleagues at the Fed are committed to doing that. And uh, we understand that in doing that, there may be a sl further slowdown in the economy. Michael Barr, Fed Vice Chair for Supervision on inflation being far too high. Now, reality TV star and entrepreneur Kim Kardashian has a new business venture. She and former partner at Carlyle Group, Jay Sammons, are launching a private equity firm focusing on consumer and media businesses. Now, for more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Danny, I was obsessed with this story. I know, I mean, this is quite incredible because there's a lot of celebrities going to private equity, but actually, I don't know whether it means it's the peak of the industry. Or actually, yeah. it's genius because she, she can give them so much exposure. Yes. See, this is exactly the thing, friend. When I first saw, saw this story, I was like, oh my gosh, of another <laughs> celebrity. Um, maybe it's like the spat boom all these celebrities got in and it represents the peak but but actually I mean there have been celebrities doing this for some time and they've been successful um, Ashton Kutcher Snoop Dogg Serena Williams they all have VCs and when you think about Kim Kardashian I mean she's run these massive businesses I mean she's gotten four billion dollars worth of valuations on some yeah. of them she's used to this her reach is massive I mean yeah. it kind of is yeah a really good move in a lot of ways especially for this Carlisle investor he was in consumer goods he can be he's the investment partner she's the operating partner it, it makes sense to me so she doesn't choose right? I mean does she mm. choose the companies or I guess yeah. if you have her on the other line you probably take that call in that meeting well so so the way that a private equity company a lot of times will work is you have someone who does sort of the investing of it so we'll do the due diligence yeah we'll do sort of the wonky financial yeah. part of it and then you but have the an identifying so that, that comes she first, definitely right? could yeah. either of them could do deal origination so you you identify often it will be more the investment partner but her job likely will be operational which is you actually work with the companies and probably post about them on Instagram I'll post them on I mean how many I think she has like millions, millions of followers what does it tell us about the market overall well the market overall it's a tough time for private equity but a brand name that can get you money right now there you go Danny Berger thank you so much our brand name <laughs> gets us money Bloomberg's surveillance early edition continues in the next hour with Matt Miller and Katie Lyons in New York Anna Edwards here in London we'll look at market reaction it's ECB day so don't miss what the market uh, is looking at, which is higher interest rates. It's 75 basis points. Is it 50 basis points hike that we get from ECB? We'll hear from Madame Lagarde a little bit later on. This is Bloomberg. Going forward, there's going to be far more turbulence. The dollar is ending up as the safe haven of choice um, by default. All in, I think it's a bearish market and rates are going up globally. Fed have, have laid out their course. They're going to be hawkish. We do think that central banks need to move aggressively over the course of this year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Investors watching the Fed's next move will focus on a speech today by Chair Jerome Powell. Meanwhile, Australia goes against the grain. Its central bank chief signals a potential end to outsized interest rate hikes. 
The European Central Bank is on the verge of a jumbo rate increase, though. A survey indicates the ECB will raise rates today by three quarters of a percentage point. And President Biden puts off a decision on whether to scrap Trump-era tariffs on China. The administration is looking at ways to help businesses seeking relief. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines with me in New York. Of course, modest gains for European equity markets today, Kaylee, but here in Europe waiting for the ECB today. Absolutely. We're all awaiting that decision, which will come in less than three hours from now, Anna. But I would note that after the rebound we saw in U.S. stocks yesterday, the rebound was pretty substantial in Asia overnight as well. Even though Hong Kong and China were actually down on the day, you had some outperformance from the likes of the Nikkei in Japan. That helped lift the MSCI Asia Pacific Index as a whole by about 1%. So coming off that lowest level since May of 2020 that we hit yesterday. You also had outperformance from Australian stocks, and that is really where the story was for me overnight. We had bond yields coming in substantially in Australia. That three-year yield down 16 basis points after the RBA Governor Philip Lowe signaled that the case for a slower pace of rate hikes is becoming stronger. That makes the RBA kind of an outlier among G10 uh, central banks and among G10 currencies. As a result, the Aussie dollar is one of the weakest against the U.S. dollar today, down by about uh, half of 1% or so to 63, uh, 67.32 at the moment. And of course, the Japanese yen is also a story that we are watching. You have Japanese policymakers from the Ministry of Finance and BOJ meeting earlier today to discuss the markets. The first time that has happened since June, but really what they're probably discussing is the weakness of the Japanese yen, which is true once again today. We are at 144.10. This is the handle we haven't seen going all the way back until August of 1998. And it raises a question, Matt, of whether or not intervention in some form may be coming down the line. Yeah, absolutely. We're all watching for that. Yesterday in the U.S., we saw a monster bounce in stocks. A turnaround after Lael Brainerd said that the rapidity of the uh, tightening cycle risks uh, creates risks associated with over tightening. And so uh, that combined with low, really low oil prices, kind of a, a, a collapse in the oil market, um, uh, five or six percent, created this bounce, which is the biggest that we've seen almost in a month. Dan Curtis, our producer in London, points out that these are, are both on Wednesdays. Should we read something into that? I don't think so. Today, <laughs> uh, in terms of futures, we're looking at some slight gains here. Well, very slight, one one hundredth of one percent. But we have seen uh, futures in the green all morning. The dollar index continues its climb and oil right now is little changed. But look at this Texas Intermediate at 82. We saw with an 81 handle earlier. We saw Brent with an 87 handle. So really coming down and that creates tailwinds for the market as well. Bitcoin right now off about 1% still below $20,000 at 19,234. But I think all eyes Anna are on uh, central banks may be now admitting that over tightening is a possibility. As Kaylee pointed out, Philip Lowe said that in Australia. Lael Brainerd now admits that uh, the vice chair of the Fed and we'll be watching, of course, for the ECB today. Yeah, and, and in the case of the ECB, a slightly different uh, time horizon uh, if we're thinking about peak rates, Matt. But, but the point is well made about what the global narrative tells us at this point. This is the European picture right now. Stocks kind of in limbo, waiting for that ECB. The same moves lower in commodity prices that Matt was talking about yesterday, boosting assets over in the United States, risk assets there. Weighed on the London market yesterday. Today we rebound a little bit. Today up by four-tenths of one percent. Flat in Germany, up three-tenths on the Cat Carons. In talking of uh, being in limbo, we're kind of in limbo on the Euro Euro dollar this morning waiting for that news from the ECB. Will it be 50? Will it be 75? Is that the key question or is the key question around the terminal rate? How high we get? How wide is the window? How long is the window for rates before we get to, dare we say it, a pivot point for the ECB and those energy headwinds really come home to roost? This is Euro dollar then. All the nines as we head towards the ECB meeting later on today. 114.98. We saw the weakest level on the pound yesterday since 1985. We continue to test those lows down by three tenths of one percent. There is a lot of focus on the ECB on the monetary side. On the fiscal side, though, the UK in focus today as we wait for details uh, in the next hour or two around the UK's policy to support households and businesses. Talking of one UK business underlining today the issues that these businesses face, AB Foods, the name is a little misleading. It owns food companies, but also Primark, which is a value retailer here in the UK, a sort of fast fashion retailer. They have been finally, and is this where it really starts for that end of the retail space? They've been finally uh, giving a profit warning and talking about the headwinds they face both in terms of the energy costs and the strength of the dollar. They have to go out into international markets to buy those products. The weak pound at 114.98, not doing them any favours. Dark Trace, this is a cybersecurity uh, business based in London, down by 
weekend. Toma Bravo, a PE firm, private equity firm in the US, was going to make an offer for the company. That has uh, been called off. They're not making that offer. The stock drops more than 30% then, Kaylee. A massive, massive move. And Anna, I know that Matt was just pointing out how Wednesdays have been the exciting days of late, but I think this is going to be a pretty exciting <laughs> Thursday because there is a lot going on today, including UK Prime Minister Liz Truss expected to announce a package of support to help ease the pain from rising energy bills. We're looking for that around 6.30 a.m. Eastern time. Could be a price tag of about 200 billion pounds. The U.S. also will be hosting the first gathering of 13 Asian nations on an economic pact aimed to counter China's rising regional influence. More on that in just a second. We'll hear from Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen as well. She's traveling to Detroit today to deliver remarks on the economy. But really, it's all going to be about central banks. We get the ECB decision, as Anna said, 8.15 a.m. Wall Street time, followed by Christine Lagarde's news conference. And then Fed Chair Jerome Powell will be delivering remarks at the Cato Institute and regional Fed Presidents Charles Evans and Neil Kashkari also will have speaking engagements. So buckle up for a big central bank day, Matt. Well, and then football, right? And that, yes. Yeah, Thursday night football kicks off tonight. It's the most wonderful time of the year. There, there you go. All right, <laughs> let's get back to the central banks. We'll talk about football throughout the program, but uh, Australia's central bank is taking an outlier stance on rate hikes. RBA Governor Philip Lowe signaled policymakers may soon abandon outsized hikes. Bloomberg's Danny Berger joins us for more. Danny? Yeah, Matt, this, this certainly got the market excited early this morning, again, very early this morning, London time, um, that this represented a pivot point for global central banks that perhaps are not going to go at it as hard as they have. And now I, I kind of can't decide whether this is a market grasping at straws. We did see some of that global move unwind slightly, whether this is just really Australia specific. But look, the RBA governor low did say things that might chime with other policymakers, essentially saying that they need to wait to see how this transmits through and a higher cash rate means they won't have to go at it as fast. And look, Look, there's some evidence that Aussie two-year yields, they have been the first to move we've seen at this cycle, that they moved higher before the U.S. did, for example. Adding to this argument, we had the Bank of Canada this week as well going 75. Uh, not going 75, I mean, they didn't go as big as many had thought that they would. So perhaps it's gathering evidence. But at the moment, look, they really are the outlier. We continue to hear from Fed chairs saying that, you know, we are going to be committed to this job of bringing inflation down. OK, meanwhile, back to the Fed conversation then, Danny, and seeing if there is any read across. Fed Vice Chair Lael Brainard reiterated the Fed's commitment to driving down inflation, although she also talked about some of the things Matt was saying about the sort of two-sided risks. She spoke at a conference yesterday. We're in this for as long as it takes to get inflation down. So far, we've expeditiously raised the policy rate to the peak of the previous cycle and the policy rate will need to rise further. So, Danny, how are banks and forecasters putting together the latest thoughts from mm. these Fed officials and coming up with their forecasts? Well, I, I think it's clear to anyone listening that the Fed's not going to back off. And, and, and in that line, we had Jan Hotzis saying that they've upgraded their forecast. They think the bank's going to go 75 this month, 50 the next month, potentially 25 in December. Now, i got to say there's some element of Goldman playing catch up to the market. I have in front of me for our radio listeners the market pricing for all the different meetings. They're not too far off from 75. 50 and 25. Um, but it is notable that we're hearing from Fed speakers saying this. We're about to enter a blackout period. We get Powell today. So it does feel like they're trying to prime the market saying, listen, we're still doing these jumbo rate hikes. We still are not done bringing inflation down. All right, a job ongoing. Bloomberg's Danny Berger, thank you so much. To another central bank now, the ECB is holding its first monetary policy meeting since July when officials raised the key rate for the first time since 2011. The central bank is on the brink of a jumbo 75 basis point hike in rates to wrestle back control over record inflation, even as the risk of a eurozone recession rises. Bloomberg's Europe correspondent Maria Tadeo is in Frankfurt and is joining us now. Maria, who would have thought we'd be talking about an ECB potentially moving 75 today. Well, Kaylee, they have to. I mean, that is the, the, the only way to go about this. The only way is up for the European Central Bank. This is a single mandate central bank. It's about price stability, close but below 2%. And if you take a look at around the inflation picture in the euro area, in some countries it now more than triples uh, that goal. So they have to hike. There's no question about it. The only debate, if anything, the real tension going into this meeting is, will it be 75 or can it be 50 basis points? Now, when you look at the 75 basis point camp, 
what they say is the reality is there's a window and when that window opens you have to take decisive action this is also about the credibility of the institution you have to hike 75 basis points today the 50 basis points this is a minority but they do make a fair argument which is you could be hiking aggressively by european central bank standards at a time in which of course the european economy risks a recession and a full-blown energy crisis yeah, and talking about those risks of recession, the energy crisis is a real wild card, a real unknown for all European policymakers. The flow of gas, uh, the, the, the weather, just how cold it gets over the winter, all these things that the ECB has to factor in. Yeah, and Anna, this is on everyone's minds, be it here at the Central Bank in Frankfurt, back in Brussels with uh, the European Commission. This is the one externality that they cannot control, but they can prep uh, for it. And Anna, tomorrow, to me, the choreography that we go from the ECB in Frankfurt to Brussels with that very important energy minister meeting that is scheduled to take place uh, tomorrow, it does tell you that the story now, the geopolitics, the economy, inflation, it really has become a single story. I would point to the words of the head of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, yesterday she was defiant, saying Europe is not going to fold into the blackmail of Russia. The goal is to cut down revenues from energy and also stabilize prices for European consumers. The question is how. Hopefully tomorrow we get some clarity on that front. All right. Thanks very much, Maria Tadeo. There in Frankfurt reporting on the ECB. Stay tuned for our ECB coverage all day long. Christine Lagarde's news conference today starts, uh, well, the coverage starts at 8.15 uh, New York time, 1.15 in London. We'll be on it, as I said, all day long. The U.S., meanwhile, will host its first gathering of Asian nations on an economic uh, pact aimed to counter China's rising regional influence. That event kicks off today in Los Angeles with 13 countries attending. This comes as President Biden is holding back on a decision to scrap any Trump era tariffs on China imports. Earlier this summer, the president had signed off on a new exclusion process for exemptions from tariffs on manufacturing materials imported from China. Jack Fitzpatrick, Bloomberg governor reporter, joins us now from Washington, D.C. for more. So, Jack, what do we know? Uh, at this point, we know there's not going to be a decision now on uh, the possibility of reducing uh, Trump-era tariffs. Uh, what we also know as far as the timeline is there are a couple things to look for. One, uh, there's an October uh, Chinese Leadership Congress meeting uh, that plays into that decision. And of course, the U.S. November midterms uh, are, are a major point because uh, any decision to, uh, to reduce these tariffs on China could look weak uh, between President Biden and, and his relationship with Xi Jinping. And that there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of willingness in Congress to push the president toward, uh, if not a hawkish stance on China, at least it, it, it sort of the appearance of, of being tough on China. Uh, so over the next few months, it would be very difficult politically for the Biden administration uh, to make a final decision. And, and yes, as you mentioned, the Office of Trade uh, of the Trade Representative uh, has started a process that would at least allow businesses to uh, to to point out tariffs that they think would be particularly harmful to job creation or anything along those lines in the U.S. Uh, but for now, there's not going to be a decision as there are a few uh, major political points over the next couple months that would make that difficult. And another angle, Jack, on the relationship between the U.S. and China, the U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan is warning about a potential Chinese invasion of, of Taiwan, or at least acknowledging that that, that is a possibility the White House uh, considers. He is insisting the White House's position over the island's status has not changed, despite China claiming to the contrary. Let's listen to what he said, because he spoke to Bloomberg for the David Rubenstein Show, Peer-to-Peer -peer Conversations. I think it remains a distinct threat uh, that there could be a military contingency around Taiwan. And uh, the People's Republic of China has actually stated as official policy that it is not taking the invasion of Taiwan off the table. That Jake Sullivan there setting out the U.S. position. So the U.S. very firm that in their view, their position over Taiwan has not changed. 
Yes, the Biden administration argument is that the position has not actually changed. Uh, a lot of this debate, the, the back and forth between the Biden administration and China, uh, is it, not necessarily over whether there has been a qualitative change in policy, uh, but sort of how much focus there has been on Taiwan. Uh, keep in mind the high profile lawmaker visits to Taiwan, including by the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Uh, that's not a change in policy. Those lawmaker visits happen. Uh, but there, there have been now three this year. There's another group that just went yesterday to Taiwan. Uh, and of course, there is a bill that the Biden administration has pushed back on, at least in terms of timing. Uh, and Jake Sullivan did mention they have some issues with the bill that would formally recognize Taiwan as a non-NATO ally. That would not actually specifically change the U.S.'s stance toward Taiwan. Uh, but you have a, a number of things in the news in terms of lawmaker visits, a bill to more formally recognize the existing relationship between the U.S. and Taiwan uh, and, and uh, just a, a ratcheting up of pressure without necessarily changing the policy, uh, but a, a, I guess a, a harsher spotlight on the existing policies and the existing points of tension between the U.S. and China. All right, Jack Fitzpatrick of Bloomberg Government, thank you so much. And you can watch that full interview with U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan on the David Rubenstein Show peer-to-peer -peer conversations on September 21st at 9 p.m. in New York. Turning to corporate news, there was just one major surprise at Apple's la latest product unveiling. In one of the worst years of inflation in decades, the company is not raising prices. Apple introduced the iPhone 14, new AirPods Pro, earbuds, and a new Apple Watch. The iPhone retains the general look of the older version while getting camera enhancements and a satellite messaging feature. Though I personally am pretty attached to my green iPhone, and I was disappointed to find that that is no longer going to be an option with these iPhone 14s. As for how all that is translating into Apple shares this morning, very little change in early hours, not even up a tenth of 1%. It is a larger move, though, in the pre-market for Asana, the software company. It reported results after the bell yesterday, raised its revenue. Guidance analysts really positive on that. Plus, the CEO is buying up shares, and as a result, the shares are higher by about 19% this morning. Also higher this morning is GameStop. And no, this is not just another meme-related move. This actually is somewhat fundamental because it too reported earnings after the bell yesterday, or I shouldn't say earnings because actually it's still losing money and its revenue disappointed, net sales disappointed. Where the optimism is coming from is a partnership it announced with cryptocurrency exchange FTX. That in theory may help their pivot toward non-fungible tokens. So as a result, that stock up about 9% in early hours, Anna. So it does feel like it's still about the meme socks and not about the earnings, but we take the point, uh, Kaylee. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's tell you what's coming up on the program a little bit later. We'll talk to Antoine Bouvet, ING senior race strategist. What is he expecting? What is important to listen out for from this ECB meeting today? And the messaging, the balance between rate hikes, laser focus on inflation, but also uh, growth threats. And also coming up, Thursday Night Football is heading to Amazon. It's a $13 billion test of whether streaming is ready for America's most popular sport. Read more of today's today's big take story at Bloomberg.com or on the Bloomberg terminal, of course. And be sure to catch our new show, Kaylee's new show, in fact, The Lineup, all about sports betting. It premieres tomorrow at 7 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. We are simulcast on both Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons here in New York. Anna Edwards with us out of London. And I'm really focused lately on uh, the situation in Great Britain because of the huge drop in the pound. We saw it fall yesterday to the lowest level since 1985. John Mayer was only six. And then funding costs continue to surge. This is the two year over two year, but um, by any measure, it's very expensive and getting more expensive to fund your business, which is concerning when your currency value continues to plummet. Dan Albaltaji joins us, Bloomberg Managing Editor for Credit, um, to talk about what this means for the UK economy and, and what it means for, for corporate credit. Dana? Hi, good morning. Uh, you, you know what? You're absolutely right. The sort of 
the sort of pain that we're seeing in markets is quite significant. See, the thing is, is that with this massive package, we don't know how it's going to be funded. And if it's going to be funded through bonds, then obviously there's going to be a massive supply issue. And if you have that, then the natural reaction is that yields will go up. At the same time, if, because of this package, basically inflation will not be as high as people thought it was going to to be, and that's why there's a massive repricing for the pound. It's a double whammy, and it's extremely painful. Repricing for the pound and the short end of uh, gilt curves. Then, Adana, thank you very much for your thoughts. Bloomberg Sana Al Badaji joining us with the latest on the UK market. More on that to come. For more market analysis, check out MLIV Go. That's the Market Live blog on the Bloomberg Terminal. This is Bloomberg. Less than three hours to go until an ECB rate decision that could see a 75 basis point rate hike from Christine Lagarde and co. Ahead of that decision, we have a 10-year German Bund yield around 160 a euro at parity with the dollar. What will it all ultimately mean for these markets, especially if it is a jumbo move? Antoine Bouvet, ING senior rate strategist, will join us next to discuss. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Investors watching the Fed's next move will focus on a speech today by Chair Jerome Powell. Meanwhile, Australia goes against the grain. Its central bank chief signals a potential end to outsized interest rate hikes. The European Central Bank is on the verge of a jumbo rate increase. A survey indicates the ECB will raise rates today by three quarters of a percentage point. And President Biden puts off a decision on whether to scrap Trump-era tariffs on China. The administration is looking at ways to help businesses seeking relief. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. Matt, European equity markets, we had a sort of mixed bag yesterday, whilst the US had a really strong session. So we played a little bit of catch up, but now kind of in limbo as we wait for the ECB. Yeah, we were up big yesterday here after Lyle Brainerd suggested there could be risks to over tightening and after oil fell we have an 81 handle on one point on text intermediate we're now coming back down a little bit in terms of futures um, not much only about one tenth of one percent a little less than that and nonetheless the direction looks like it's changing ahead of what is it four hours four hours yes. <laughs> four hours until the market open bloomberg u.s dollar index is rising on the rise again although not as high as we saw it yesterday still the strong dollar has been a, a tailwind for uh, sorry a headwind for um, other countries economies and um, one of the things i think that's pushing central banks to act maybe a little bit more the ecb may be hiking 75 basis points today nymex crude yeah still with an 81 handle it's coming back down now about three quarters of uh, 1%. This is really interesting because we even got a, a rate, uh, or sorry, a production decrease from OPEC plus, but with the lockdowns in China, you can understand that demand is less by about 27 million people. Bitcoin falling about 1%, 19,220, but still hovering around that $20,000 level. Kaylee, what do you see in terms of pre-market movers? That's what I'm here for, Matt. Deliver the pre-market movers and help you tell time. So you. in terms of pre-market movers, GameStop is what I want to start with because of course, this stock often moves with nothing related to fundamentals, but we actually got some news yesterday. The company delivering results, I say results, after the bell because it's still losing money and net sales disappointed. But where the optimism is coming in this morning is the fact that they announced a partnership with FTX, the crypto exchange. Maybe that helps with that shift to NFTs. So that stock is up the better part of 10% before the bell. And a number of stocks are moving related to analyst action as well. Deutsche Bank upgrading Moderna to a buy in part due to strong uh, earnings results. So that stock is up about 2.2%. Stiefel initiating a buy rating at AMD, uh, citing an execution, uh, executing on the product roadmap going pretty well. So that stock is up about half of 1%. And then First Solar upgraded to a buy at Goldman, a 172 price target, which would be about 28% upside to where the stock closed yesterday. It's up about 4% in early hours this morning, trading right now at 140, Anna. 
Kaylee, uh, we did have small gains on European stocks earlier. We just dropped to unch, unchanged on European stocks. There's a lot to wait for, though. Details on the fiscal stimulus in the UK. Details from the ECB on their thinking, the communication and how it falls down between those two stools of fighting inflation, of course, but being mindful of the risks to growth in the future. This is what limbo uh, looks like on the pound as we wait for further details of fiscal policy. 114.82, that low uh, that we haven't seen since 1985 being touched in yesterday's session. Uh, this is ABF, the Associated British foods business which owns the fast fashion chain Primark and they had a profit warning this morning announced a profit warning and really it's a tw it's a sort of classic twin worries for UK business right now on the one hand the higher cost of energy on the other hand the strength of the dollar the weakness of the pound means going out into those international markets to buy those clothes is more expensive dark trace is a cyber security business of course Matt here in London and uh, it is down by 34 percent or so today because the private equity business Toma Bravo based in the US was going to buy the company those two Talks, though, have now been cooled off. All right, so we'll continue to follow those stories. Now let's bring in Antoine Bouvet right now, ING senior rate strategist, because there's so much going on in the world of central banks. Antoine, it looks like we, I mean, we didn't have a pivot from Lael Brainerd. She still said they're going to do whatever it takes. Um, rates are going to have to be higher for longer. But she did acknowledge that there are two-sided risks to continued tightening. And then Philip Lowe um, at the RBA um, said something similar. You've heard this kind of dovishness from Philip Lane. Are central banks starting to kind of chill? No, uh, especially when it comes to the Fed, uh, it's clearly a minority view. I think that uh, it's a good time now to highlight um, the risk of over tightening. This is going to be a conversation that they're going to have at the end of the year. But as we've seen in Jackson Hole, the message is very clear. Uh, the market should not be uh, focused on you know, the next stage after tightening. Uh, when it comes to the ECB, it's very different. I think we have two camps and we still have a pretty strong dovish camp that came out earlier this week with various interviews in a magazine. And clearly these people don't want to hike 75 basis points. They want to be more gradual. They want to be paying more attention to that trade-off between growth and inflation. And this is going to be very interesting what makes it to official ECB communication today. Mm, yeah, uh, good morning to you, Antoine. It'll be interesting to see then. I mean, if, we'd got, if we just got 50, quote unquote, just got 50 from mm -hmm. the ECB, would that be seen as dovish? When you compare it to the big jumbo hikes we've seen from the Fed and the like, would it, would it signal that the ECB, ECB is not quite as focused on inflation? Yes, absolutely. Uh, 50 basis points would be seen as a dovish move, and I think the market will be extrapolating to the next meetings, thinking that when um, bad economic news come and bad economic data arrive, then the ECB will flinch and, and not hike as much as the market's pricing. So yes, it will be very important. And what kind of acknowledgement of the risks do you think we should get from the ECB? You know, they'll want to, just like the Fed, they, they might want to give these hawkish messages mm -hmm. about how much they want to fight inflation. But at the same time, everybody knows that the risks to the downside for the Eurozone economy are so intense. So what kind of messaging would you think they'll be delivering? Yeah, there's the difference between should and will. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think they will be acknowledging much. This. I think the uh, Fed's strategy to be very much focused on inflation and ignoring these uh, economic downside risks uh, has paid off for them. And I think a lot of the hawks on the governing council and perhaps even a majority think that this is the right strategy. So if you look at the economic forecast back in June, they were extremely po uh, optimistic. Uh, they're probably going to be too optimistic this time ag uh, around again. And in a way, the market will interpret that as saying the path is clear for more aggressive hikes. Antoine, we are all so focused on the hikes for all of these central banks, what size they will be, how high they ultimately go. We also just don't really talk as much about the balance sheet. When are we going to be having a more substantial conversation about QT in Europe? This is really the, the potential curveball uh, curve ball for today. I mean, uh, I don't think they'll, they'll talk about this today. It's too dangerous, but uh, the Hawks want to talk about this by the end of the, uh, of the end of the year. There's a lot of things that can happen on the balance sheet uh, front. They can start discussions about QT. They can talk about their reinvestment policy, extending that from one bond program to the other to manage spreads. They could signal to us that they are closer to activating the TPI. Uh, if they hike more aggressively. So there's a whole range of things that can happen. And the, the risks are quite two-sided. Ultimately, if they make a mistake, uh, DCB will have to pick up the pieces because they already dipped their toe back in the bond market and they already said it is their job to prevent uh, an acceleration of the widening in sovereign spreads. All right, well, we may or may not get some insight into that then in about three hours' time, Antoine. Before we get there, we also expect to hear from UK Prime Minister, new Prime Minister Liz Truss, outlining her plans for energy support for consumers and energy companies. How do you price fiscal policy in the UK to the tune of perhaps 200 billion pounds and what that ultimately is going to mean for gilts? 
uh, it's very difficult. So I try to, to break it in two main impacts. One is the economic impact and how it's going to protect the economy from certain growth downside and potentially also make it, uh, you know, make inflation slow down the, 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 the inflation downside that we have. That's one aspect. And that, I think, is already priced because we cannot know the size of it and, and uh, the definition of the energy cap. What we don't know is how it's going to be financed. And this is very important for the gilt market. Um, unlike the pandemic in 2020, 2021, uh, the Bank of England is not buying bonds anymore. They, they're you know, releasing them in the market through quantitative tightening, and they will be selling them uh, in September. So if you add up quantitative tightening, if you add up the ex existing deficit, the new deficit on the energy cap, plus uh, potential tax cuts, that's a lot of money that private investors are going to have to uh, put into the gilt market. Probably around 120 billion this year, around 210 billion next year. So that's an unprecedented amount. And the question is, who will buy them? Uh, one of the answers historically has been foreign buyers, but uh, with sterling uh, weakening a lot, you can reasonably wonder whether these investors want to take that FX risk. Okay, yeah. So will that gilt supply test the kindness of those strangers? Antoine, thanks mm. very much for joining us. Antoine Bouvet of ING. We'll stick with that story next. Next, we'll talk about what's going on in the UK. We'll discuss soaring energy prices with Johnny Marshall, senior economist at the Resolution Foundation, a think tank that focuses on improving living standards here in the UK. We'll discuss what we expect from today's, uh, today's fiscal boost. This is Bring Back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up today on Balance of Power, Eurasia Group President Ian Bremmer. That's at 12.30 p.m. in New York, 5.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. I will make sure that people are able to afford their energy bills at the same time as dealing with the long-term supply issues to make sure that we are resilient in energy and never get into this position again. The UK's new Prime Minister there, Liz Truss, speaking yesterday during Prime Minister's questions in the House of Commons. Now, Truss is expected to lay out her plan to help ease the pain for, uh, from rising energy bills. That's at 6.30 Eastern time, so in around 45 minutes' time. Uh, the government could end up spending as much as $230 billion over the next 18 months to contain energy prices. Uh, Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden joins us now with a look ahead to what to expect. So uh, one of the big questions that still hangs over this package is who's going to pay for it? Indeed, because it is a hefty price tag, as you say, and despite it costing £200 billion, almost a third of consumers uh, would still see their energy bills triple uh, compared to last winter. In terms of how to pay for it, Liz Truss was quizzed on this at her first standoff at Prime Minister's Questions with the opposition leader Keir Starmer yesterday, but she seemed to rule out a windfall tax. And then later in the day, it seemed that perhaps she would continue the current windfall tax on energy companies, just not extend it uh, to include power generators or income increase the rate beyond 25%, which means it's going to take a lot of borrowing to fund this. And we also heard from Andrew Bailey, BOE governor, yesterday speaking to lawmakers. He said uh, that the bank might have to put the brakes on active quantitative tightening, given how much borrowing it's going to uh, mean. Mm. Which brings us back to the former Chancellor Philip Hammond's warning to Liz Truss on Bloomberg TV. The markets are watching. Yeah, absolutely. And to the guilt conversation we just had with our, with our guest from ING. Lizzie, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Lizzie. Burden with the latest there on what we expect. Let's get a deep dive into this then, more on energy and the policy options that governments face, not just, not just here in the UK, but elsewhere as well. Johnny Marshall joins us, senior economist at the Resolution Foundation, a think tank that focuses on, on improving uh, the standard of living for low and middle income earners. Uh, Johnny, great to have you with us. So from your perspective, with the goals that you have in mind for this kind of policy, what would make a well-designed policy? Good morning. So there are a number of things that any sort of policy in the energy sector needs to be considerate of. Um, one of which is, of course, the ability for people to pay their bills. So something that would be more targeted at people at lower incomes would be one route to go. And that's something that the government has done before by, for example, giving payments through the benefit system up to £650 for qualifying households. There's giving flat amount of money to everybody, which is also set, apparently set to continue following the announcement today with £400 going into everyone's account. Or there's intervening to change the price that energy, the energy that energy the households use, so that instead of giving a, a set amount of cash, the the sort of support mm. offered is proportional to the amount of households, the amount of energy that households use, and that is quite important because, for example, a 
a family on a low income with four children will use a lot more energy than a family on a low income with one child. And accounting for that difference in energy need is very important in whatever the government does. Uh, Johnny, so, so interesting perspective there. Is, it, is there an economist perspective on how this should be paid for? Is that an entirely political decision? We heard our colleague just referring to Liz Truss yesterday saying she doesn't like windfall taxes. Of course, we already have one in place on oil and gas companies in the UK. Uh, but is, do, you, do you have a view? Is there a view at the Resolution Foundation on who foots the bill for this and over what time horizon? I mean, we, we would agree with it be better, better funded through borrowing than going on household bills, for example, which is one of the, the ways it was trailed earlier in the week. Funding, th funding this sort of expenditure through household bills is much more aggressive than putting it on taxation because, in general terms, wealthier people pay more tax, so we foot more of the bill, so it's a fairer way to pay for it. However, within the energy sector, there are, of course, huge amounts of money being made, and this is in the production of energy, so oil and gas, especially in the North Sea, and also within the electricity sector. So. The, the linking of electricity prices to gas prices means that companies that don't burn gas to create electricity are getting the profits as if they were doing so, but without the costs in the first place. So there's a huge amount of money being made within the energy system, which comes up at the expense of household bills. So it seems only a matter of time until that sort of that sort of disparity is squared off. Jo Johnny, if, um, if the government steps in to help subsidize energy prices, um, that leaves families free to use extra cash um, to pay higher prices for other things. Doesn't this fuel inflation? Um, well, energy, energy bills is a large component of, of you know, how we measure inflation, and our estimates about that capping um, the price cap at £2,500 would shave about four percentage points off where we see inflation peaking next year. Um, of course, there are, you know, there, are, there are wider factors. The cost of living crisis isn't just um, focused on energy bills. The price of energy feeds through into how we get around, what we eat, what we buy, everything else. Um, but sure, sure. Well, if this holds my energy bills down, then I'm free to pay more for that car or bid higher on this eBay auction or, um, you know, uh, pay more money to watch Premier League soccer. So, you know, doesn't it sort of drive it up everywhere else? Well, it brings energy bills down relative to what they would be with no action, but it, it, they're still left significantly higher than they are now and have been historically. So, you know, the first few years of the price cap being introduced, the average typical household bill was about £1,100 per year. And if it's capped at £2,500, that's, that's, you know, clearly more more than doubling of this, this like, long-term average. And even at that lower cost, we still had, you know, 10% of homes in Britain suffering from fuel poverty. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we haven't completely, you know, we have uh, the price signal has been sort of de deadened to some extent, but it's still a huge increase in energy costs, which, right. you know, the, the main priority for this is making sure that people can afford to, to not, not freeze this winter. And this is one, one quite good way of doing so. But Johnny, here's the thing. We're talking about this winter and sure you can help them out this winter by capping energy prices, but is this just going to have to become permanent policy if the gas supply issue is a problem for Europe and the UK for many winters to come? I spoke with one commodity strategist yesterday who said we're going to see elevated natural gas prices through 2025, 2027. Mm, I mean, the UK is you know, hugely structurally reliant on natural gas. Um, as a nation, the UK, you know, doubled down heavily on gas when it started flowing out of the North Sea in such volumes. And as such, you know, we're on the household level, we're one of the most gas reliant nations for heating our homes. We have, we burn almost, you know, we produce about 40% of our electricity from natural gas. And getting getting away from this this sort of old fashioned reliance on on natural gas is going to take is going to take some time. And you know, there's a clear consensus about what the solution is. It's just finding the ways to do that as quickly as possible. So, for example, one of the things expected this afternoon or late this morning is an announcement to start looking at the supply of energy as well as the sort of retail side and part of that would be offshore wind but there seems to be a big gap on say onshore wind and solar which are much quicker to build much quicker to bring online much quicker to commission and can start generating cheaper and less gas linked energy prices energy which is less less linked to the price of gas much quicker mm. so we should be looking for more more of these sort of big structural changes in our energy sector we need to reform our energy markets in general so that the price of gas isn't such a dominant factor in parts of the energy sector for which okay. it isn't isn't relevant and also we need to you know cut energy use at home this is by insulating houses by changing behavior all, all of this is and we to, expect to yeah, we, and we expect we might hear some more on that today as well johnny thank you very much for your time really good to speak to you johnny marshall senior economist at the resolution foundation coming up on the program amazon makes a 13 billion dollar bet on america's most popular sport more on today's big take next this is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines in New York. Anna Edwards with us out of London. Let's get over to Tom Keene right now, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, um, to preview the program and show us, Tom, your single best chart. What have you got? Single best chart is chart of the year. It's one part of chart of the year, Matt. It avoids Japan, uh, just for TV and for today with a focus on the ECB. I thought I'd take, char uh, take uh, Japan out of chart of the year. It is nominal GDP back 20 years with America well-ordered and a perfect perfect straight line, and Europe a train wreck. There is the boom in Europe of 15 years ago, and then coming off 2009, as you lived in Germany, Matt, Europe absolutely flat lines. The delta here is about 119 percent growth over 20 years for the United States versus a, 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 a nicely lower number for Europe, and I'm going to call it the Paul Lagarde Delta. It's an extremely emotional chart about what 75 basis points means to Christine Lagarde. Mm, a nice reminder of the real long-term challenges the Eurozone faces then, uh, Tom, and, yeah. and rather than just the short-term ones, which we talk about a lot. Who are you going to be talking to about these issues? Well, we've got a number of people to talk to today, but Anna, you are dead on, dead on, dead on. This is, this is little to do with the war in Ukraine. It's accentuated it, but most of these uh, ideas were here uh, before. John Lisa and I are going to drive forward to the ECB uh, today, a wonderful setting. So I really want to highlight Holger Schmieding of Berenberg. He is truly one of the most astute uh, market economists in Europe. Elsa Lingo starts as strong on weak sterling and weak yen. All right, Tom Keen, always dead on. Thank you so much. Now let's take a look at what else we're watching today other than central banks. It's football. It's my favorite time of the year. NFL kickoff is tonight with the Bills versus last year's Super Bowl chance. The champs the Los Angeles Rams. Our big take story today is looking at the fact that Amazon as of September 15th will be the only place where you can watch Thursday night football after its 13 billion dollar deal that will last for about 11 years. But Matt it's the most wonderful time of the year. Most people go into seasonal depression in the winter. I think mine is February <laughs> to August when there's no football. So I'm so, so excited because football is my absolute favorite as are sports in general, which is why I'm super excited that starting tomorrow, we have the debut of my and Damian Sassauer's new sports betting show, The Lineup. It's a huge industry, a hundred billion dollar handle potentially expected in 2022. We're gonna dig into what bets are most likely to pay off historically. Nice. It's gonna be really awesome. So I, I'm, I'm really actually. Excited. I'm super pumped about both of these things because I've been out of this country for the last five or six years. I haven't been able to watch the NFL, so I'm definitely looking forward to getting um, a, an early start on the season and following it all the way through. And then I want to be betting more. You know, I want to <laughs> know what the line is. I want to make or most likely lose money on this sport throughout the season. So I will oh, definitely nice. be tuned in to your program. Oh, no. And now you cast me as the as the person who brings the tone down because I'm just <laughs> going to tell you about two lessons learned here in Europe. Certainly when it comes to watching the Premier League, as Amazon entered the list of broadcasters who, who, who show Premier League games, the price has gone up. We did that analysis at Bloomberg a couple of days ago, in fact, which showed even in a competitive environment where there are a number of broadcasters, the cost has gone up since Amazon joined the fray. And also, we have 60 years of sports betting here yeah. in the UK. I'm sure you did a bit whilst you were living here, Matt, but we learned a few lessons about the things not to do, which I'm sure in the US people are very mindful of. Yeah, everyone knows how to bet in the UK. And But you know what? <laughs> I already have Amazon Prime, so I'm all in uh, regardless you're of the cost. You're all set. <laughs> okay, excellent. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you're happy. Um, well, I, I hope you enjoy the football. That is it for Early Edition. More surveillance still to come. This is Bloomberg.